we had to invest out of the sense of necessity. And I think he will do it out of a sense of habit yeah. is the hope out of habit, out of almost like hygiene It's something that I do because it's always been a part of my life. And I have seen immense value from continuing this practice. And so I'm not going to stop now. And whether he cashes out at 28 <laughs> or is financially independent at 45, like I'm not pushing any of those things on him. I just want him to have options and I want him to be able to compete and to have a fighting chance at creating the kind of life that he wants. Like I think anyone else does. Welcome to the Rich and Regular Podcast, where we explore life at the intersection of money. I'm Kirsten. And I'm Julian. And today we're talking about raising a rich kid. <laughs> our it, approach to parenting. Our approach to parenting. I wrote our approach to parenting. Raising a rich kid <laughs> is what we're talking about today. Um, but first, I want to give a shout out to Marve D. Marrow, who left us a five-star review that said, your favorite podcast, favorite podcast. <laughs> I like that. We are. The rapper's rapper. Um, <laughs> this is one of my top three podcasts about all things money, and it's not two or three. Listening to them makes me feel smarter. They present in a way that's not overly technical or boring. The information is digestible for all ages. As an avid follower, I like this show and content they put out on all platforms. Yes. Appreciate that, Marve. Shout out to Marve. And fun fact, we actually met Marve and his wife, Jasmine, at our Dallas book tour. We've met them twice. Now. Yeah. Well, yeah. that was our first interaction. And well, actually, our first interaction was me clowning them because they walked in late. And I, <laughs> I think I made them sing. <laughs> but we got to hang out afterwards. And uh, it was because they were kid free to come to the book tour. And we're like not trying to be inside. They wanted to be outside. So we all went and got food and caught up on life and marriage and kids yeah. and work and all sorts of other existential midlife topics. And yeah, I'm so, pretty sure we introduced them to, uh, you know, every family has that, that fringe set of cousins, those cousins that, that yeah. and, and, and Marve <laughs> and Jasmine, they, they hung out. They still, they, they stuck with us. They and met so, my fringe cousins. Yeah, they did. You know, we all got those cousins that are not, that are not necessarily the best representation of the family. <laughs> Um, but they Don't be talking about there. my family I'm like that. Saying. My cousins are perfect, <laughs> just as they are. We all have them. We all have them. <laughs> um, okay, I wanted to talk about this, and I wanted to talk about this for a, a variety of reasons. The first is because we, I just feel like we are in the thick of parenting. I feel like everything we do has some kind of parental uh, slant to it. And or so, consideration. Or consideration, yeah. for sure. Um, but I also think that when it comes to money and investing, you know, one of the very interesting ideas I had the other day as I was spending time with Bo, our son, was that I was also raising an investor. Mm. Like, I'm not just raising a kid that I want to be kind or that I want to make good decisions around his food or to treat people nicely or any of those things. I'm also serving as an example and teaching him the fundamentals of money as something that will impact his life. No different than learning how to brush your teeth, yeah. right? And it was a really, really interesting thought. And I, I think I had this in the back of my head for the longest period of time. But for whatever reason, it didn't really kind of sink in until a couple of weeks ago when I was having a conversation with him about math and really watching his fluency and how much better he was getting with it and how much more confident he felt because of his understanding of math and just me being patient with him through that process as mm -hmm. we're doing work after school. And then all of those things just started to make a little bit more sense because I think I knew in that moment that, oh, wow, he's going to understand money at a considerably higher rate than I did when I was at his age yeah. because he has the benefit of two entrepreneurial parents who do this work, who understand it and so on. So all of that to say, this does not mean that it's easy. And yeah. I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions people make. And so that's part of the reason why I wanted to have this conversation. Yeah. And I want to be clear on the outset that this is not generic advice as to how you should raise your own children. This is just a peek into how we're raising 
hours, we do get a lot of questions from parents about kids and the different milestones and the choices that you have to make, some of them more costlier than others when you're deciding about how you want to raise them. And I think what I hear when I talk to most parents about their children is how they're trying to give their child or their children a better life than the one that they had. Like, not just across one category, not just like a consistent roof over my head or, you know, heat in the winter, across all categories, like across all the different areas. And I think because we're so such a visible generation of parents because of social media and internet. There are just so many public displays of abundance when we're talking about child raising that it creates this pressure to give our children more and more and more, whether we mean to or not. Yeah. We were just joking. Me and my friend Bree were just joking and she called uh, Valentine's Day a big old mom mom petition, <laughs> like a competition, but for moms, <laughs> because it was all about which kid had the best outfit or the fanciest class treats. Yeah. And I just thought that was spot on. The same thing happened to Halloween. It used to just be one day and now it's this week long festival of trunk or treat. And then, then there's this party and that party. And I just think there is a pressure to give our children the best of everything, to raise the floor, so to speak, across all levels. And it makes something that's already expensive, even more expensive. Yeah. And then you have to wonder, like, who are you doing this for? Did your child even get the right lesson? I think the idea of wanting to give your child or your children things that you didn't have is one of the most important parts of what I think sets the tone for how people parent as a whole. Like yeah. the, just that thing, you hear it all the time. Like, I want to make sure that they get to go places and do things that I didn't get to do. And I think there is a bit of a financial, and I, I think there's a bit of an understanding that, yes, there's a financial implication to this. I think a lot of people feel like they have pretty clear understanding of where they want to draw the line. But I think a lot of people will also admit that, like, all right, we got to like reel this in because you see it to your point with holidays. You certainly see it around birthdays in terms of how big or grand that celebration needs to be. And it just, I feel like is one of those things that contributes to why raising a child is so expensive. Like it doesn't have to be as expensive as the reports and all of these things suggest, but because of that cultural kind of belief, there's almost by spending this money, you can do no wrong. There is no real long-term consequence. Like it's almost like a guaranteed investment. And we know for sure that that that. is not the case, right? Yeah. Pew Research did some research on this and they do research on everything. Like every question I have, I feel like Pew has done a study on. It's 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 the brand of surveys. Right. It's top 10. (laughs) But one of the most interesting things that I've took from their research was that it's about 50-50. There are just as many U.S. adults who say they are trying to raise their child the same way that they were raised as there are adults who say that they're raising their child differently. They're trying something differently. Now, of course, they took it across splices. So it's not just like a holistic difference. They looked at things like values and religion, uh, behavior and discipline, love and relationships, education, freedom and autonomy. But they they surveyed parents and it's basically a 50-50 split. Half of us are completely happy with the way that we were raised and are just doing like a copy paste 2024 version. And the other half are on this new path where, to your point, we're getting experimental. Like what if we make holidays a week long thing instead of just, you know, the day of after school? Yeah. What would it look like if we do professional family photo shoots instead of not having any photos with me of them at all. Like, so it's just a, it's an interesting like societal place that we're at right now. Yeah. That's good to know. I'm not so, uh, I'm not nearly as unusual as I thought I was, right? So there are just as many of us as there are people out there who want to just keep things the same. But it does make me wonder if friend groups are like, if you look at your parent friends, how many of them are people who raising their kids exactly how they grew up versus, are in this experimental, let's try to do this to 2024 style or somewhere in the middle. Well, I, if, if I'm judging based on my last interaction with the last time a lot of me and the fellas got together, it is very much split down the middle, which was shocking to me. Because yeah. I thought we were all kind of on the same page. Like, surely we're like moving in another direction. And a lot of people were like, <laughs> Hell no. why would I do that? I'm perfectly, <laughs> look how I turned out. And I was like, look how you turned out. Um, okay, so... Raising a rich kid, parenting with respect to Bunny. Um, This is such an interesting and big topic. We're going to try our best to break it down. But I think a couple of the things that we've done just off the top that I think are good. 
right? Like I'm grading us and I know I'm clearly biased, but I think one of the things that we have done that I stand by, and I know was certainly different from what I did or what was done to me (laughs) as I was being uh, raised was half of the money that our son earns or receives, we invest on his behalf, right? And he, I think because of that, has a fundamental understanding. It is baked into his understanding of money to live on half. And it doesn't feel restrictive because we do pretty much everything for him, right? Mm -hmm. And I just, I I am so impressed by that. And again, I'm saying that, you know, not to sort of pat us on the back. I know we're the ones that are doing it. But at the same time, this is other part of my brain that says, well, yeah, of course you should do that. Why wouldn't you do that? Don't you understand how time and compounding interest works? Don't you understand like how easy and like how different your children's lives could be if everyone did that? And that's one of the things that I'm really, really proud of. I remember when we opened his 529, it must have been weeks after he was born. And that was like on my to-do list. I remember when we opened his custodial account. I remember when we funded it. And I will also say this, what I really, really like about this strategy, and I can't wait to see what happens 20 years from now, is that the way we invest in our son's custodial account is completely different from the way that we invest. Right? Oh, like we have taken a much more dare I say, conservative approach by focusing mostly on broad-based mutual funds. But we are far more aggressive when it comes to his funds. Why? Because we've got such a long road ahead. You've got opportunities for that money to compound at a significantly higher rate. And so to be a little bit more specific there, in our own portfolios, we invest a good bit in tech, right? Like we believe in tech. We've got tech index funds. And that is very much a reflection. uh, And that is very much reflected in his custodial account, but to a significantly higher degree. Um, The other thing that we do with his account is invest a bit more aggressively in individual stocks. And what's really interesting about that, this is just like divine timing, if you will. But one of the individual stocks that are in our son's custodial account is Coinbase. And just a couple of weeks ago, uh, they approved the Bitcoin ETF. Mm -hmm. And in response to that, we saw probably the biggest jump. His stock in Coinbase grew over 50 percent from the beginning of February 2024 up until today when we're recording this, which is right around the second and third week of February. And I remember looking at it a couple of months ago and saying, all right, I don't really know how this is going to pan out, but I had to remind myself and say, you know what? I don't know what's going to happen, but that's not the point of this exercise. I think what I have really, really enjoyed and kind of marveled at is how well Bo has understood that, has accepted it, which kind of makes sense. He doesn't know any different. And that to me is just fascinating. It's like, yeah, like you don't know that a 50% savings rate is considered extreme. This is just normal. To right. No different than any other thing that we do, right? We travel, we eat certain foods. You just think everybody does this. And he's going to learn at some point that everybody doesn't. And it's just really, really interesting just to kind of watch him go through this process and to accept it and to take this idea of saving and apply it to other areas of his life because he certainly understands the importance of it. Yeah. And this is the benefit of starting young. It's even that 25 percent that we have invested in individual stocks, it's capped. So even if all of those stocks tank, he's lost at most 25 percent of his portfolio Obviously, we wouldn't let that happen, but that's the worst case scenario here. It's not that he still can't retire. It's not that he won't be able to buy a house one day. It doesn't impact his college It doesn't fund. impact. Yeah. So we've capped the downside, but it opens up tremendous upside because he's got 60 years to yeah. maneuver and, and change that portfolio balance over time. And so it's just one of the benefits that we take advantage of because he's so young and can explain to him along the way and get him really engaged. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting to see him also draw a connection, uh, maybe not to the, the nearly the same extent as he does with saving, but he is starting to understand the importance of earning because when we are able to do things like go on vacation for longer periods of time or hang out in the middle of the day or just the idea that both of his parents are home whenever he gets home from school, I've explained to him that this is because we're entrepreneurs. This is because we've achieved financial independence. This is because mommy and daddy have made certain decisions 10, 15 years before you were born. And he doesn't quite understand it, but there are moments in his life 
like he has a thing about traffic already. Like he <laughs> just feels so free. He just wants to be able to go wherever he wants. And whenever there's like traffic, which means that we're out in traffic when everybody else is out there, he's not accustomed to that. Yeah. He's very accustomed to like free flowing. And so you can already tell now that he's like, gosh, where are all these people going? Yeah. Like, why are there so many people here? Because he's so accustomed to being able to maneuver and like do whatever he wants. And again, I just think it's really, really cool. Yeah. So on top of normalizing a high savings rate or a high amount of savable income, the other thing that we wanted him to understand were self-imposed constraints, yes. a.k.a. the limitations that we voluntarily put on our family in order to manage our money more effectively. I want to acknowledge, first of all, that this is a privilege. It's different to have a self-imposed constraint versus an actual one. Sure. And I'll acknowledge that some people might call this discipline, like some people might call this the marshmallow test, where it's like, it's there, but you and you can see it, but you can't touch it or eat it. Our friend Heather actually calls this manufactured scarcity, which is another way of putting it. But it's all about just accepting that we are financially privileged, but that doesn't make everything a free for all. You don't right. just get everything that you want. And you need to understand that when you lose something or when you break something, yes. even though we're able to replace it, it doesn't mean that it happens automatically or without consequence. Yeah. And he's starting to understand more now that the things that he has cost money. Yes. We had an incident the other day where he broke his headphones and I told him very clearly like, okay, well, since you broke them, you're going to have to use your money to replace them. And he stood up straight like... Well, hold on. <laughs> I have an idea. <laughs> and he went and grabbed the packing tape and just taped them up. And so now he's got like the lopsided yep. taped up headphone situation yep. because it was more important that he save his money. The headphones were still functional. They just look bent. Yeah. <laughs> they just kind of look bent up. Yeah. But I think it's important to know we started that training since he was young. It wasn't necessarily about money. But even when he was a toddler, one of his antics about food was that he would want something different than what we served him. And I don't think this is unique to him. Yeah. Most toddlers have preferences about what they eat. But we would we would always tell him, that's all we have. Like, what's in front of you is all we have. And, and we say it so much, we used to joke that that was going to be the name of his memoir. <laughs> it was just going to be called, That's All We Have by that. Bo Saunders. <laughs> because we said it so much, but it was important for him to understand that he does have options at times, but sometimes it's just a matter of what's available and you need to make the most. Use a sauce, cut it differently, make an airplane noise, whatever you need to do to enjoy that food or go without it. But there's not just this overwhelming abundance in your life where you live at a restaurant that short orders everything right. that you that you want to eat. And mommy and daddy are not always going to be bending over backwards to Tease you, right. you know what I mean? Like you don't right. like something, so we're just going to make something different. We're going to go somewhere else. Like that's not an option. What's been interesting to me has been the role that video games has played in serving as a metaphor to help him better understand the difference and the importance of saving and investing. I think we wrote about this on the blog a couple of years ago, but one of the things that we've done is we've used what he likes to do, which is play video games and to help him better understand, like, yes, the power in conserving things can actually yeah. be very useful for you in the long run. So we used to play this racing game and like a typical racing game, you may have like three turbo buttons that you can use. And he had this habit at first of just coming out the gates to open the race just starts and he would burn through all of his turbos. Right. Yeah. And then he just wasn't winning and he wasn't winning. And so we started to explain to him, save them, wait until the right time to do it when you really need to pass someone. And I think that really, really helped him understand the importance of saying, oh, wow, there's power in not consuming everything that I'm being given as soon as it's being given to me or right. as soon as I earned it or as soon as I found it. And we've done very similar things with baseball. It's a very complicated way with baseball, but he is starting to realize through learning the sport, like the power in the role that he plays in his team and that we've been able to kind of draw some connections between that and also just our family, right? Like obviously we're not expecting you to go out there and get a job, but we are expecting you to hold your weight. We are expecting you to clean up after yourself and to take a leadership role in your care. Like we're right. not expecting you to be an expert on medicine or any of those things, but there are things that you have to do and should be willing to do without us intervening or having to tell you over and over again. And being able to use either one of those things as a springboard to then talking about money and helping him say, hey, this is the role that you play. You got $100 for Christmas. We're going to invest $50 of that on your behalf. What you do with that 
other $50 is up to you. And you've got to be comfortable living with that decision, which also can be difficult for us sometimes because we're kind of hoping and rooting for him yeah. and, and really thinking that he's going to make the right decision. And most cases he does, yeah. which is something that's really, really cool and has been really, really great to see. I've actually been really surprised at the role that gaming and sports has been in teaching him what it feels like to earn something because he's only six. He'll be seven in a couple months, but yeah. he's he's still a child. <laughs> so right now, most of his money is gifted. And naturally, he's a little confused about how money is earned and how yeah. it works. He tells us all the time that he doesn't have to get a job. He just has to keep losing teeth <laughs> yeah. or he just has to keep waiting for Christmas. And so I'm I'm torn on how to handle allowances as he gets older. Right now, we don't pay for chores because it doesn't really work. He's expected to clean up after himself. And it's hard to incentivize him with money when money is so available, so to speak. If he gets it on his birthday, if he gets it when he goes to grandma, if he gets it at Christmas, like at Easter and the Easter eggs, like it's it's pretty available. So it's hard to incentivize him with more through cleaning. And then at six and a half, we still pay for most of his stuff anyway. So he doesn't have this strong need or desire for money in exchange for doing chores. Now yeah. he he likes money in general, but that earning piece is still missing. But surprisingly, video games and sports has been a great tool for this because through the tournaments and through unlocking new skins yeah. and hitting different levels, he knows what it feels like to earn something. And he has these little victory laps around accomplishing something through a video game that we haven't been able to completely translate to money, but we'll get there. Well, so I think we have been able to translate those things with money, but I will say investing has been a harder concept. And what yeah. I've learned in trying to find other ways is that the best way is to just explain investing, right? Yeah. Instead of trying to say, oh, it's just like this or that thing, that just gets kind of confusing. It's hard to find the right metaphor. I, correct. And yeah. what I've found, at least to some extent, is that he doesn't really need to understand the fundamentals of investing. He just needs to know what it is and what it does. And so you actually have the benefit of being able to be plain spoken and being able to say, hey, this number is small or big, right? How about this number? That's bigger, right? How about this number? That's even bigger, right? And he just thinks that's cool. Like he knows that a million is bigger than a thousand. A thousand is bigger than a hundred. He doesn't understand all the intricate details, but he knows that these numbers are bigger. And so when you tell him you can have this amount of money and you say it in a tone that is realistic, I found that that is really what actually helps his understanding. I think the other thing is helping him understand cost in a very real way, right? Mm -hmm. So just the other day we went and got a haircut and, you know, I think a lot of parents do this, but I gave him the money to give to the barber so that he had the understanding of what it takes and whether or not you're going to get change or how much did he say it was? Here's how much money I'm giving you. And he gave it to the guy. And of course he ran away because he thought it was kind of silly, <laughs> but he was blown away at how expensive it cost yeah. just to get a haircut, right? Because he knows how much other things like his toys cost or how much it might cost to replace his headphones. And so all of that to say, you know, as much as we've enjoyed using metaphors when it comes to saving I think there's also room for just being real. And I think that's an important tidbit for anyone else out there who might have a child. Sometimes you just need to be frank, mm -hmm. right? And just be plain spoken and say, this is investing. There's saving and then there's investing. And if you save this amount of money every single week, this is how much you would have. If you invested this amount of money every single week, mm -hmm. this is how much you would have. And I can assure you, if your kid understands greater than or lesser than, that's all they need to know right. to be able to say, well, I want this bigger number. And we've been able to take that a step further and say, okay, well, here's how much $10,000 might afford you to do. Like you would not have enough to get the car of your dreams, right? Here's how much $100,000 would be. You might be able to get the car of your dreams, but you see that house over there that you really, really like? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't be able to get that house, right? Hey, you remember this trip that we took to Florida? Remember we were there for how many days? Five days? Great. You might be able to spend the summer in Japan if you had this amount of money, right? And so he's been able to draw connection to the importance of investing just by me highlighting the things that he has spoken about and said that he wanted in life and the things that he desired. Just going through that activity has been valuable in helping him 
understand the importance of investing and better understanding why we save and invest money on his behalf. And that leads me to one of the things that I did uh, a long time ago as I was just playing around with an investment calculator, which, you know, I think a lot of people who are financial enthusiasts do. And I was just kind of thinking about his life and saying, well, what would happen if we did $100 every single month? Or what would happen if we took his birthday money every single year and invested it on his behalf? And then I said, you know, what would we, what if we just didn't complicate it at all? What if we just grinded for a short period of time, planted a $12,000 seed, right? Like a one-time thing. And we just let that money compound, like no periodic contributions, no nothing. Like what would happen? And we started with $12,000 because I think we'd started with like $1,000 a month. And we were like, you know what? Screw that. $12,000 one time. Congratulations. What would happen if that money compounded at 10% over a 45 year period? I'm not 45 yet, but I can just, I'm a round up and say, by the time he reaches my age, that account would be valued at around a million dollars. It's actually a little bit over a mm-hmm. million dollars. But then I thought about the way that we invest on our son's behalf. And granted, we haven't planted a $12,000 seed, but he's got a couple thousand dollars in that account. And it's not investing at 10%. The funds that we're investing in are slated to return around 16%. It's a bit more aggressive, right? He's invested mostly in tech. And he would actually hit that million-dollar benchmark at 28. Mm -hmm. And I just thought about, like, when I was 28. When I was 28, I I still had student loan debt. I was graduating with my MBA. I was still working two jobs, just trying to get by, hoping to earn $40,000 just to have some consistency in my income going to get a job. He would not have any of those challenges, right? And I thought about that. And one part of my brain said, wow, that's really, really cool. The other part said, well, what does that mean? Like, does he need those challenges? And and, and I think he does need challenges, but I don't know that I want to introduce him to struggle as a challenge in that way. I want him to be challenged, but I don't know that I want him to experience struggle the way that I did. It goes back to what we were saying at the top of this episode, where that in many ways becomes the driving force and sets the tone for how so many people parent. And I think that's true for me to some extent. Yeah. I mean, I think once you realize that there's no amount of money in a portfolio that removes you from the human experience, you can get very clear on the types of struggle, quote unquote, that you want your child to experience and to avoid. The struggles around money and being financially insecure or feeling financially insecure is a struggle I don't want him to have. And does that mean he needs a million dollar cushion? No, but he certainly needs enough of a cushion to know that, okay, even if I don't have a traditional job or even if there's a period where I'm not able to work or I want to pursue a passion project. He's not worried about where the next meal comes from or whether he can get a roof over his head. Those are the types of struggles that I don't want him to worry about. But it goes back to a, a broader question about childhood. And if you think about how much childhood has changed now compared to 50 years ago, it's drastically a different. And we don't even have to go back 50 years. You think about 30 years when we were children. Yeah. Childhood now is completely different than childhood 30 years ago. And so when you are a member of of a marginalized identity, whether you're black or you're a woman or you're Latino or you're gay or whatever it is, the generational comparison of childhoods and what's possible in a lifetime is just very different. The leaps that people have to make if they want to improve their child's circumstances are much greater if you're coming from a marginalized identity versus if you're coming from a family where this was the norm 50 years ago. And when I think about the future for him, when I even think about his own children, and I'm trying to predict how different his children's childhood is going to be, I know that he needs that financial cushion. I think if we're honest about the cycles that we see in the news today, it's very clear what role socioeconomic status is going to play in the future. There's no world in which I'm sending him out there unprepared without some level of understanding about the larger economic system that he lives in. Unprepared and under-resourced. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, And I don't even have to imagine in some cases the future is already here in a lot of places, in a lot of regions, in a lot of families. It's just not equally distributed, meaning the future that's available for some children is completely different than the future that's available for others. It's alarming that you can look at 
at a zip code that someone is born in and determine what their income yep. opportunities are 30 years from now. And so if you're studying history and you're studying the present and you're looking at the distribution of wealth and opportunity in the country, there is, for me, a natural desire to do whatever is possible to give my child the advantage that they need in order to compete and so that's our goal with investing. Investing is one of those things that can transcend those challenges in a way that doesn't limit what's possible for us today. It's yeah. something as simple as setting aside a couple hundred dollars and letting it sit for 45 years, 60 years. And you can do that when you're talking about children and seeing what happens on the other end. That's something that I'm interested in. Yeah, I think for me, it, it's a matter of looking beyond just understanding the importance of saving and investing and really making sure that our son has a fundamentally different relationship with those practices, those yeah. ideas. And I think we're going to do that, right? We had to save. We had to invest out of the sense of necessity. And I think he will do it out of a sense of habit yeah. is the hope. Out of habit, out of almost like hygiene. It's something that I do because it's always been a part of my life. And I have seen immense value from continuing this practice. And so I'm not going to stop now. And whether he cashes out at 28 <laughs> or is financially independent at 45, like I'm not pushing any of those things on him. I just want him to have options and I want him to be able to compete and to have a fighting chance at creating the kind of life that he wants. Like I think anyone else does. The reason we're talking about this is because we simply just don't hear enough people talking about this. I yeah. think every now and then there's a day or two where the idea of investing on in our children uh, come up. And I think people get all up in arms because they think we should just let kids be kids. But the reality is without money, it, you will live a very very difficult life. Yeah. And one of the easiest things that we can do is to sit back and let time and the stock market do its thing, do what it's done for the last hundred years or however long it's been. So I want to stop here because this episode is a little different because we thought that this might actually be a great opportunity for you all viewers and listeners to hear from him. Let's yeah. see what he has to say. <laughs> and I don't know where this is going to go. Um, I don't know how confident he's feeling in his understanding of money, saving and investing, but I feel pretty good about it. So we'll see <laughs> what happens. I'm going to pause here. And when we come back, we're going to be joined by our son, Bo Saunders. <laughs> and Lord. we will see what he has to say about why saving money is important. All right, Bo, guess what? What? This is your first podcast interview. <laughs> Does that sound cool? Uh-huh. Yeah. Are you excited? Uh-huh. <laughs> looking at your face? You're looking at your face. You're supposed to be looking at the camera over here, buddy. <laughs> but you can't stop looking at yourself. <laughs> Are you nervous? Yes. <laughs> Mama, mama's mama's going to ask you a couple of questions. Okay, so in this podcast episode, we were talking about saving money. I know. And we were telling everybody how much you like to save money. And I want you to tell people why you like to save money so much. I don't get it. <laughs> Do you remember when you first started learning about saving money? Yeah. Okay. What do you remember about that? Um, uh, I don't remember the place we went. What do you remember about where we went? That you guys were on stage. So you heard about saving through mommy and daddy? Mm -hmm. And we were somewhere and we told you about it? Yeah. Okay. You don't remember what we said? No. Okay. Well, what about some of the things that you know about saving? So that was the first time you learned, but there are some things that you do that you remember about saving, right? Yeah. Can you give me an example of something that you did that you remember that was cool? Uh, nope. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, you have a savings goal, right? You have an amount of money that you want to save? <laughs> yeah. How much money do you want to save? $1,000. $1,000? Why? What are you going to do with it? <laughs> Buy something. Okay. How much money do you have now? 229 Whoa. And how do you think you're going to get to 1000 By getting Christmas money for Christmas? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you have any ideas of what you might want to do when you get $1,000? No. No? Nothing you want to buy? Wait, I think once I get more, I saw um, 
At that store, we could get a chandelier. A chandelier? Where you gonna put it? Uh, in your room? There. Oh, you wanna put it, you wanna buy the house a gift? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you ever been to a bank? No. Do you know why people put their money in a bank? So they can make it grow. Okay. Yeah. And keep does, it safe. What's another, yeah, to keep it safe, too. What's another word for, what does that mean? Mm. Making it grow. What do you mean by that? I don't know. <laughs> well, what's the word that we learned? That how do we make money grow? I don't remember. You don't remember? Can I give you a hint? Mm, yeah. Begins with the letter I. Uh, and then the letter N. Uh, in investing. Very good. Yay! <laughs> now, what is investing? Do you remember what investing means? When you make your money grow. Mm-hmm. And do, what do you know about investing? Uh, I don't know. I want you to use your imagination. Okay. Let's imagine you have a little brother. Mm -hmm. And you had to explain to your little brother why saving money was important. What would you say to him? Um, so you can buy something. <laughs> do you like saving money? Yeah. What else do you save besides money? Save my toes. Um, no. Remember how you, don't you save dojo points at school? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Talk about that. Uh, why do you save your dojo points at school? So I can get different prizes. Mm-hmm. Bigger prizes or the same prizes? Bigger prizes. I didn't spend anything yet. We talked about saving. Let's yeah. talk about money. Why do you like money? So we can afford things. Yeah. What's your favorite thing to do with your money? Save. <laughs> Save it? <laughs> you don't like to spend it? Yeah, I don't want to. Why right. not? <laughs> I can... Um, Buy a house. <laughs> you want to buy a house? Well, you don't you want to live be, with mama and dad anymore? I want to be a no millionaire. What? You want to be a millionaire? Yeah. What is a millionaire? Uh, when you have a million dollars. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, who taught you about that? <laughs> uh, from my iPad. Did you learn that on YouTube? Yeah. Who had a million dollars? Mr. Beast? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or was it Minecraft? Mr. Beast. <laughs> what did he do with his million dollars? No, he was just trying to show us and told us how much it cost. What cost? Um, the houses. Oh, what was in the house that cost a million dollars? Um. Do you remember? I think the only the house part. Oh, just the house was a million dollars. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when you're older, how do you think you're gonna make money? Uh, I play baseball so I can be paid. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. You want to be a professional baseball player. Like Acuna Jr. Like Acuna Jr. <laughs> you got to practice. And Matt Olsen. <laughs> and Matt Olsen. That was yeah. actually on the wall at d -Bat. Oh, he was? Mm -hmm. Very cool. Well, do you think you should get paid for this podcast? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How much do you think you should get paid? <laughs> Infinity dollars. Infinity dollars. Infinity dollars. <laughs> That's a lot, but <laughs> what do you know about what mommy and daddy do? What do we do to make money? Work. Okay. What do we do with your money when we invest it? Do you know what that does? You can afford more things. Yeah. Can you afford more things now? Or yeah. do we have to wait? Wait. And what happens when we wait? You can get more. When? How long? A long time. <laughs> <laughs> how long? So how old are you now? Six. And how long do you think it'll take? Years. How many years? <laughs> Five years. Five, Five years? years? No, <laughs> Five years <laughs> until when? <laughs> until I um until I reach my goal. <laughs> oh, your thousand dollar goal? <laughs> I think oh, okay. you're gonna reach your goal quicker than that. That's <laughs> just what I think. One day? <laughs> no, that's a little too quick. Okay. Last question. Are you ready? Yeah. What do you think all kids should know about money? Um, that you can't spend all of your money. And why do you, should you not spend all of your money? So you can't, so you can't afford anything. Mm-hmm. And what happens if you can't afford anything? Then you can't live perfect life. <laughs> <laughs> do you have the perfect life? Yeah. Can we have a house, dude? <laughs> we can take cover. 
<laughs> That's all the perfect life requires. A house dude. <laughs> yeah. Right. And food. And food. TVs. Yeah. TVs. And mamas and dadas. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for being a guest on our show, Bo. Thank you for listening. Bye. <laughs> I'm leaving. Well. <laughs> that went about as well as I imagined. Yeah. He was very articulate. Yeah. About and very passionate. <laughs> it reflected all of the gems. He did. He did. That we've been talking about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're not just gaslighting you, but... Um, yeah, I mean, look, he's he's every bit of six years old, right? You're yes. going to get that um, whether you like it or not. But it truly is some of those moments where you least expect it, where you start to see him exhibiting restraint. Even today, just randomly, and we're like, ooh, that would be really great if he said that on um, camera, but he didn't. But he was saying that he gave someone a dollar today yeah. at... Uh, his winter baseball camp program. And we were like, why did you give a kid a dollar? He was like, oh, I just wanted to. I just felt like being nice. And yeah, I just like to share. I just like to share, you know? And I was <laughs> like, all right, well, how old is this kid? He was like 11. I was like, all right, we don't share with <laughs> slow, him. Slow your roll, bro. <laughs> if he was six or seven, that's cool. But you, you might have gotten got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we will teach him the lessons of the okie doke. And that's actually my favorite part about parenting. I love this stage because they're old enough to be somewhat independent, but still need you to help them navigate the world. At the end of the day, they're still new here. They've only been around this little planet for yeah. six years. So, yeah. <laughs> and, and for the pandemic babies like him, where he's a cusper, where half his life happened before and half happened afterwards, the world has changed so much yeah. that... They're just they're just different. But I think anyone who has been in early education or has a kid in the same age range as Bo, you know that with education, it all comes down to a teacher. You know, everyone has that one teacher that makes the difference and the right teacher makes all the difference. Yeah. And I think the role that we take in his life is his first teacher. Yeah. We are trying to educate him on all things, but that includes money. We want his OG money lessons to come from us. And, you know, whether you heard it or not <laughs> on the podcast, <laughs> please believe we are we are doing that on a on a daily basis. Yeah. And I'll also say this, like those were not fed lines. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. not something that we said, hey, say this. It was an experiment. Yeah, it was See, an how experiment. does a six-year-old do on a podcast? I don't know that we'll be running that one again. I don't know that I've ever heard <laughs> him even use the word millionaire before. So that was the oh, first I didn't either. But me. once he said it, I was like, that sounded like some Mr. Beast just, algorithm. Rhythmic. Yeah, it definitely sounds like something <laughs> he, check his he saw on, Clear on YouTube. Um, <laughs> in terms of final thoughts, we haven't done that in a while, but was there a final thought or some kind of closing summary that you had that this experience or this conversation uh, that, that may have come to mind that you think might be important? I mean, other than ones I just said, I think the statistic that we said at the top of the episode should just kind of lighten the pressure yeah. on on parenting. You got a 50-50 chance that your kid is going to want to do it the way that you did it or try something different. And so I think the best bet is to use the knowledge that you have right now to make the best decisions that are in front of you and try really hard to stick to a plan or at least a strategy for giving them the lessons that you know are going to be evergreen and important. Yeah, I think for me, it's a matter of not overcomplicating this process. I think there are a few examples that highlight the power of time and compounding interest than looking at the future outlook when you're investing for kids. I think when you start talking about a 40 year horizon and you're speaking to an adult, it kind of seems like, oh, well, I don't even want to bother doing that because I don't know what's going to happen with my life. But when we're looking at a kid and it's like, well, yeah, I can see him being at least my age. All of a sudden, it just seems so much more common sense. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that I really just want to normalize. We've said this during talks. I know for sure we mentioned it when we were in Washington, D.C., in collaboration with the D.C. Urban League. And we were speaking to a room full of professionals and sharing very similar anecdotes about our lives and things that we were teaching our son. And for me, I think the goal is not making this feel special or unique. Yeah. Like the fact that we do these things for our kid, I think is no 
different than teaching your kid how to brush their teeth or how to tie their shoelaces or ride a bike. It is necessary. And so this entire idea that what we're talking about is something that is elitist, Mm -hmm. I think is actually really problematic. I think it's fundamental, Mm -hmm. not elitist. We need to really change the way that we think about it and talk about investing for kids. It's not an extra credit investing activity. It's not something that you do above and beyond. It's fundamental. We should be doing these things because our kids will need money, just like we need money as we get older in our lives. And so that's how I think about it. And um, I I really want to make sure that we stop romanticizing it in a way and start talking about it as we did today. Like they get some of it, they get some of it, they don't. It doesn't matter. We're still going to do it. My son doesn't understand. I keep going back to teeth. He doesn't understand exactly why he has to brush his teeth every night. Yeah. He's heard about cavities, but he's never felt a cavity. It doesn't really matter. He's still going to brush his teeth every single night. Yeah. And I think that's how we can look at investing. If you do that the same way, <laughs> guess what's going to happen on the other end, 30 years, 40 years down the line? That's how you make a million. And I think that's what we're really trying to get through in this message is that this is not about a secret to success. This isn't about doing some tax beneficial thing, even though there are loopholes to doing that. But like so much of this conversation is oftentimes rooted in all of these other ideas. I find that to be counterproductive. Like it it defeats the purpose in a lot of ways. It certainly takes the teeth off of generational wealth. You know, everybody makes it as if this is a secondary goal or something that requires more initial investment or it requires you to take on a a risky investment. Or something that the the upper echelon of people do. And it's like, no, like this, any one of us that are listening, if you're listening to this, you're a U.S. citizen and you have money to invest. You can invest on behalf of a child. Mm-hmm. You can open up a 529 even if it's not for your child. And we'll link to the episodes that we've done on specific investment accounts for children in the show notes. But yeah, yeah this is something that is accessible to everyone, but it does require a paradigm shift in terms of how you think about the money that you spend on your children and where you put it. Yeah. Well, thank you for listening to another episode of the Rich and Regular podcast. If you like what you heard, then let us know by leaving a five-star rating and review or leave a comment below and keep the conversation going. We will see y'all next week. If you like videos like this and want to see more, make sure you click subscribe and turn on notifications. 